There's a game that I thought about running for years. I've never done it, but I've thought about it for years. You introduce me to someone new, someone I've never met before, but I look over this person and think, you know, he looks kind of shady to me. And so I say, do I owe you money? Like that. Put the doubt in there. Ask the question. Have we met before? Do I owe you money? And the beauty of that kind of question is that it will tell me immediately if I'm dealing with a liar because a liar will say, you know, I think you might be right. Or something to that effect. will claim that I do owe this person money even though we've never met before. And the reason that I've never done it is because that kind of liar will not stop lying. This is the nature of Donald Trump is a liar who will not stop lying. And so you introduce the opportunity for gain to be realized from telling an outrageous lie. And that kind of thug very often will continue to tell the lie and um, improve upon it, <laughs> emphasize it, amplify it, until he's worked himself up into a rage about the imaginary money that I allegedly owe him. This is the nature of bad guys. It's fun for me to watch children do this. That a child who has decided to try to manipulate his parents by means of affected displays of negative emotions, affected unhappiness, affected misery. The display will begin with guile. It is affected. The child knows that he has no reasonable, rational claim to make, but he takes a chance to see what happens, and sometimes it pays off, and that's why he does this, because sometimes it pays off. This is why you never, never, never yield to this kind of behavior in your children, because you're just encouraging them to become liars. This is how you cultivate deceit in your children, is by rewarding it. But if the display doesn't work and yet the child um, wants to continue playing the game, he will again, he will do the same thing as the thug will do. He will accelerate the negative displays, amplify them such that they're more negative, and eventually work himself up into a lather, into a total meltdown. This is where meltdowns come from. Among children who have achieved conceptual fluency, that a uh, preconceptual child can have an actual meltdown related to uncommunicated, unmet needs, but a pursuit of values that originates in guile and is unsuccessful, can the child can amplify the negative displays until he is truly in a state of outrage, until he is truly melting down He's doing only one thing. I emphasize, Agi quote Agis, you should only be doing one thing. Here's an example of negative display behavior that turns into a, um, a fit. And once it, it, you reach that level of pitching a fit, the child is literally doing only one thing. He's only pitching that fit. And it's no longer um, a matter of guile. It originated in guile, but now it is an actual genuine fit. And in much the same way, the thug will work himself up into a rage until the rage is, is authentic. The putative injury never existed in the first place, but the outrage over that putative injury is now genuine. It is now um, genuine outrage. This is the nature of hotheads in political movements. I'm only really interested in libertarianism as a political movement, but I'm... Um, persistently aversive to hotheads among libertarians because that kind of hot-headed behavior is exactly like the um, birth of a temper tantrum in a child or in a um, thug. It originates in guile in affected display behaviors that are progressively amplified until the hothead is in a state of rage, entirely self-induced and really without any reasonable rational cause. I don't care for that kind of behavior and I don't think it's productive. I don't think it's productive of liberty, which is the only reason for engaging in any sort of tactic in movements. I don't have anything to do with movements anyway. I don't have anything to do for the most part with other people um, because 
the only benefit to be realized from aligning with other people is an increase in muscle power. You certainly don't get any smarter. Um, two heads are not better than one. Frequently, two heads are much worse than one. And 50 million Frenchmen not only can be as wrong as one, 50 million Frenchmen are likely to be 50 million times more wrong 50 million times more often. I'm not interested in amplifying error. I'm not interested in remasticating error. I'm not interested in um, building mob movements out of error. I don't care for that kind of behavior, and I don't think it's productive of liberty or of human happiness. I don't think it's egoistic. We are uh, hard upon a world where rebellion is going to be an important survival strategy. It's never been a problem for me. I've lived in a state of rebellion my entire life, and I don't have a problem with it. It's not it's normal to me, and I can't imagine it not being normal to everyone. It should be normal to everyone. And in fact, it is normal to you. You just don't think about it. If you drive, habitually drive the speed limit, I'm going to guess that you have a cautious temperament or that you are um, a um, strongly cautious, sociable personality. Incandescent, incandescence will always exceed the speed limit because it's a way to get other people to notice them. Drivens will always exceed the speed limit because they are in a big red hot hurry to get where they're going. But if you habitually break the speed limit, you understand rebellion in the only way that matters to me, even though you probably don't categorize it as rebellion. And that may be the only um, sort of rebellion that you're actively involved with. But I wanted to talk about the art of proficient rebellion because with every passing day, rebellion becomes more and more propitious as a survival strategy. And accordingly, I wish to warn you about the dangers of getting involved with hotheads and their movements because they're not productive of liberty. If anything, they're productive of ever greater slavery. They not only incite the thugs to become more thuggish, they incite the bystanders on the sidelines to demand more thuggishness from the thugs. Again, a explanation for the phenomenon that is Donald Trump, the big thugs who's going to put down all the miscreants who bother me. Nobody bothers to think that what happens when Trump turns on them. I think about this all the time because I recognize that Trump is exactly the kind of thug who will imprison or even kill people like me. Probably not me, but people like me. Ideally, he is... Um, a big fat chicken shit pussy, but thugs can talk themselves into anything just by going through that state uh, stages of of successively amplified outrage. Exactly the temper tantrum that we see among five year olds. Trump is a five year old. We are watching one Banana Republic incident after another in the once proud American experiment. They were watching the United States become yet another Banana Republic, yet another kleptocracy. The uh, need for rebellion grows every day, and therefore it is appropriate for you to think about how to rebel proficiently, how to rebel in such a way that your life is better in consequence of your rebellion and not worse, which is what we get with these hothead rebellions like we just saw in Oregon, that life is worse for everyone involved and arguably life is worse for everyone, that they were protesting about the unfair nature of their slave contract and their slave contract is now much worse than it was before they started protesting. This makes no sense to me. In the same respect, the Tea Party Rebellion. The Tea Party Rebellion was really a slave revolt, but it was an ineffectual slave revolt because the slaves didn't want to didn't want to admit that they were slaves, and they didn't want to admit that they were that they were engaged in a slave revolt, and they didn't want to um, rock the boat. 
But when um, conservatives and Tea Party Republicans and the presidential candidates, blah, 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 when Antonin Scalia talks about the United States Constitution, all they're really talking about is a slave contract. And they're pissing and moaning that the current slave masters aren't hewing appropriately to the terms of the slave contract. Well, it's simply a slave contract. And this is why my favorite justice is not was not, is not, was not Scalia, it's, it's Clarence Thomas, because Thomas, um, as much as he might talk about the United States Constitution, is nevertheless a champion of human liberty first. And the Constitution does not protect your liberty. The Constitution delineates the means by which your liberty will be violated. More slavery, less slavery, it's all slavery. But the beautiful thing about being autonomous, about being sovereign, about being controlled from the inside out, about being self-controlled, is that no one can enslave you. They can put you in chains, they can put you in a cage, they can't enslave your mind, they can't stop you from speaking without binding your mouth, and they can't stop you from thinking without putting a bullet through your brain. Which is not to say that they won't do that. <laughs> they might well do that. And um, the more they get away with these kind of Banana Republic thug tactics, the more likely they are to do things like that, which is why you need to be considering the art of proficient rebellion. But proficient rebellion is not a hot-headed pursuit. It is not an attention-seeking pursuit. It's not a high-eye pursuit. To the contrary, proficient rebellion consists of pursuing indestructibility. The Shark will go after someone, and your ideal situation is for that someone to not be you, to not be your spouse, to not be your children, to not be the things that you love in this world, and therefore making huge hothead displays or getting involved with hothead movements is um, a way of attracting the shark's attention to you when you want to divert the shark's attention from you. If you do intend to exceed the speed limit, do not do it in a bright red sports car. You do it in a gray minivan, no one will ever pull you over, and I have proof of this. I drive a gray minivan, and I drive at whatever speed I want to, and I almost never get a ticket. I don't obey any law that I don't want to, and if I happen to be in compliance with the law, it's simply an accident of circumstance. I am a civilized man, and therefore I am... Arguably, arguably in compliance with most laws most of the time, but it's not because of the law and it's not because I fear the law. It's not because I'm afraid of any consequences that might be visited upon me for violating the law. It's because I don't intend to prey upon my neighbors and therefore I don't do anything that would put me on the wrong side of either criminal statute or um, civil judgment. But this is the ultimate nature of proficient rebellion is do as you will, do what you want, do as you choose. We live in fear of this omnipotent monopoly state, but the fact of the matter is thugs are lazy. Whether they're freelance thugs, like the ones I don't say, do I owe you money to? or officially organized thugs in the state, they wouldn't be thugs if they weren't lazy. This is what the nature of being a thug is laziness. And taking account that thugs are lazy, you can do what you want, provided you don't go out of your way to rub their noses in it. If you are a big, showy hothead who insists on advertising your scoff lorry to be... to scoff at the law, if you insist on drawing attention to your scoff lorry, then you almost certainly will be prosecuted. Whereas if you just drive your nondescript gray minivan 10 miles over, 15 miles over, 25 miles over the limit, you'll almost never have a problem because the thugs are lazy and the only time that they're vigilant is when they are seeking to make an example of someone. And therefore, if you're not going to make a good example, then you're probably not going to have a problem. So that would be my first bit of advice for achieving proficient rebellion would be simply to pursue indestructibility, to make yourself unattractive to the shark and um, to do nothing to draw 
attention to yourself from the shark. And yes, the shark will prey on someone, but it won't be you. The next step in the process, if you happen to be mired in the statist muck, is simply white mutiny, to do literally as you're told and nothing else, and to do it to the letter and um, offer <laughs> no help to your despoilers. Make them work hard because they don't want to. They don't want to work hard, so make them work hard. And if they decide to divert their attention to someone else because it's too much trouble working with you, you have successfully rebelled against them even while they had you convinced that you were trapped in their spider web. Edward Abbey um, invented the expression monkey wrenching, which I do not advocate, um, not the way that he proposed it because uh, it involved um, potentially inflicting injury on people who had done nothing to deserve that injury. I don't I don't think two croquet is valid in any form, whatever. Two wrongs make a right. I don't agree with anything based in that. I don't think that there is any, any virtue in vice. And therefore, if you insist that your liberty consists of inflicting pain upon other people, my thinking is that you're the bad guy. People who inflict pain on other people are bad people. If you're confronted with a situation where your only way to achieve your own peaceful existence is to engage in an act of violence, in other words, if, you are, if you're being met with violence, then to respond to it violently may be appropriate. But to initiate violence against another person, even when you're insisting that this is an act of post hoc retaliation, I do not agree with that. If you're engaged in warlike behavior outside the context of war, then you're the bad guy. But there is a way of going about the objectives of monkey wrenching without inflicting violence on people, and that is simply affecting incompetence. That when you're filling out that paperwork that you know you shouldn't have to fill out, do it badly and leave things blank. Make mistakes. Make errors. No one can fault you for this. No one can criminalize this behavior. Everybody makes mistakes, but you're making the task of your despoilers that much more difficult, and again, you're inviting them to concentrate on someone else rather than you. I could probably come up with more. I think you could come up with more on your own, but the reality of your life is that no one really cares what you're doing except the people who know you intimately. And so to live your life in fear of prosecution or to um, hew religiously to all of the insane laws that have been passed that no one intends to enforce, I think this is absurd. You should just do what you want to do. You don't go out of your way to commit crimes or uh, especially commit property crimes or um, crimes of violence against innocents. This is not what you're all about. And if it is what you're all about, then you have no business talking about liberty. You're not interested in liberty. You're interested in rationalizing crime. But to permit other people to dictate your actions, whether those people are family members, neighbors, so-called friends, or um, thugs, freelance thugs or organized thugs, to permit those people to dictate the terms of your existence is absurd. They have no actual concern with what you're doing. They're not paying any attention to what you're doing, and they won't do anything about what you do in any case. And therefore, you should just live your own life. Be who you are. Do what you want. Have what you love. No one will stop you. No one will care. And... If you sacrifice your one unique, irreplaceable life being religiously compliant with absurd, useless, pointless, self-destructive rules, no one will be benefited. You will have added to the goodness of the universe in no way at all, whereas hewing to your own standards is the only good.
the way to think about any particular sort of rebellion that you think about engaging in is, will this make my own life better? My life, my family's life, my estate, my wealth, and my future prospects for wealth, will this make my life better or will it make it worse? Getting involved with hotheads and their idiotic movements will almost certainly make your life worse. Whereas judiciously rebelling against all the insane laws that people try to impose upon you will make your life better. And this is <laughs> the purpose of your life is to make your life better. If you don't do it, no one else will do it for you. If you make your own life worse, no one else will care. And if you do what you want, no one will stop you anyway. This is proficient rebellion. And this is the Church of Splendor. My name is Greg Swan. So glad to talk to you. I will talk to you again next week.